Monster class. It's one of those interesting pieces of history when you start talking about these ships. Because they're, of course, never completed. Which means a lot of people get to talk about them and get to talk about, you know, what they could have been. And some of those people put forward some really constructive, interesting ideas about them. Some put forward some absolute twaddle. But this is Key Ships. And the Key Ships series is not necessarily a profile of the ship. It's a discussion of why these ships matter. It's a discussion of the technology of the ships and why they matter. And if you're hearing a load of gas escaping, that's because I just ran out of iron brew and so now I'm refilling iron brew. Before anyone else again, there seems to be a large number of Americans who believe that this is an alcoholic drink. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not. It's a soft drink. It's the Scottish version, well, the Scottish equivalent of Coca-Cola. Um, rather similar time, similar scale in terms of its history. And um, what can I say? The Scottish, for some reason, like orange drinks. Or drinks which have sort of a, a rusty, burnt tone and has that slight indefinite aroma. So, multi-class. There are myths. And I mean there are some absolutely picturesque myths. Including one the other day I was reading, which was an otherwise very interestingly sourced article. Really interesting. Which basically said they were carbon copies of the Midways. Because the British had finally realised the importance of armouring their carriers, and so had just asked the Americans for the design of Midways and were building them. Now, in the defense of that author, English was not their first language. In further defense of that author, I'll be surprised if they have had access to many materials on the Malta class. It was in a wider discussion of aircraft carriers, and why China is pursuing them. And the author was not a historian. But it was a very interesting paper to read from some of the various observations it gave. It just was also, in certain points, completely and utterly so far off the mark, you have to wonder if anyone had even done a Google search. So let's start off with what they were. Well, if you go and delve into the UK National Archives in Kew, you will find a whole series of aircraft carrier design studies. Started in the 1935 sort of period, but actually there's a couple which seem to come from earlier than that, from 1934. They are principally the work of people like Sir Stanley Goodall and Admiral Henderson. And they go through what are the various options the Royal Navy is able to build. Within the treaty limits, and also what they might build if the treaty limits were lifted. Yes, the Royal Navy has design studies of what they would like to build if they didn't have to worry about the treaties. In fact, often their design process could be argued to be a bit reductive because it starts off with the dream of what they would love to build. Their ideal carrier. And it looks at a tonnage that works out to on paper. And then it works backwards from there down to the tonnage they're allowed. And then they start off the design process again with that tonnage in mind, and they put in what they think is going to be the best form on paper. And they were, look at the similarity between the two. They do all sorts of studies. It's There are huge, huge folders, files, box files, and I'm talking big, heavy-duty cardboard boxes full of these studies. 
and all the data and information around them. And I was lucky enough to spend pretty much my PhD thesis reading through those studies. I think I photographed every single page in there. And if next year does turn into, which I'm thinking it probably will do, the year of the aircraft carrier and the year of the year of the aircraft carrying the flagship, then I'm probably going to go back there and photograph them again because they are some wonderful, wonderful images and because I have now got a far better camera than I had in the first two years of my PhD thesis. That <laughs> was just a little time ago. I was... Might have been about a decade ago now. More than a decade ago. Oh, I was so young. But anyway, leaving that to one side and the fact that despite doing all that work on aircraft carriers, my first book, and the first book to achieve a second edition status, which I'm told is available, is Travels, Battles and Daring's. On Destroyers. Which basically I got into because every time I was looking at the aircraft carriers and they had a really important mission, this class of destroyers kept turning up as their escorts and they were going... Surely they'd be picking newer destroyers by this point, or... Why is it always these ones? And then you look into them and you go, Oh! So that's what happened when carriers weren't being escorted by tribals. <laughs> this is what happens when they are. Oh! <laughs> HMS Nubian. Using her stern to take a... Bomb aimed for illustrious. Might as well. You know, Eskimo loses a bow, Nubian loses her stern, her rudder, and steers herself home using her, sh uh, her using her shafts. So, basically using her engines to steer. Yeah. And the battle class, which in the post-World War II environment become number one escorts for any aircraft carriers needing protection. And the Daring's, which are pretty much built, you could argue, to escort the carriers post-World War II. In fact, usually they are the senior picket, senior escort of a carrier battle group, because the cruisers are fewer in number and so need to be free to move around and do cruisery things, and all the presence mission, all the distant pickets, so it's a Daring class, which is, hello. We hear you're keen on attacking our carrier. Whilst we cannot offer you any advice, we would stress most uh, strongly that should you proceed with this course of actions, we will be forced to make things very unfortunate for you. That is the whole daring class mantra. If you ever are lucky enough to see HMS Vampire in Sydney Harbour like I was not that long ago, you will soon get that feeling from looking at her. This is what Daring Class do. They help you experience an unfortunate course of events. So, leaving that all to one side, and that interesting paper, were they the British Midways? Well, yes and no. In that, both the Midways and the Maltas represent... America and Britain being able to build the carrier they want to build without worrying about treaty limitations or in American cases also speed of construction. The Essex class were the carrier they could build as quickly as they could to the size they wanted. The Midways were the carrier they would have always liked to have built. It's rather an interesting thing when you look at the treaties. The whole way through there are the battleships, there are the capital ships they would like to build. The size they would like to build versus the size they actually get to build. Where's your wife? Where's your wife? Sorry, magpie. They keep jumping up out somewhere. Under. In the case of aircraft carriers, again, there is the size, there is what they would like to build. And there is what they can build. For the Britain, there is an extra problem. They need to be so many places in the world. The Americans are quite happy to structure their carrier fleet around having five aircraft carriers. They end up experimenting, trying to make lighter and lighter carriers so they can try and get more. But, you know, they, they still are happy to do it. 
the British know from the get-go, that's not going to be enough carriers to be where they need to be in the world. There just isn't. So both are building lighter and lighter things. Now, I will admit something. The Malters at roughly 47,000, 48,000 tons in standard are not exactly that design which Henderson was looking at as the ideal carrier in the, in the, the, mid, the mid to late 1930s. It's not. Neither is the design which I'm fairly certain, although I haven't seen it myself, but I've a friend who's done a similar work to me on American carrier design has told me that the American designers... No, because by the time you get round to actually designing and actually building your Midway or your Malta, technology's changed. A lot! The British start work on the Maltas in 1942. Seven years! War started in 1939. There's been all sorts of fun things happen since then. You've still got that idea of you want four elevators. You want... A massive, massive hangar. You want to be able to take a large air group. You also want to be armoured so the vessel will survive. All these things are a factor. But it's not the same design. But it is the same design. It's just slightly scaled up in proportion for the way aircraft have grown for starters. Because that's one of the other things with aircraft carriers. It's a constant. You build an aircraft carrier, it has a hangar. It can con accommodate an air group. And then the air group just keeps getting smaller and smaller with each generation of aircraft. And people go, it's because the aircraft are getting more expensive. No, it's because the carrier wants it built. The hangar is a fixed size. And if the aircraft get bigger, they take up more space individually. And also, then you need the space for maneuvering them around within the hangar. Which also requires more space. So, actually as each generation of aircraft comes into service, your ability to carry as ma that many goes lower. Just as the way it goes. So you hope the aircraft make up for their reduced airframes by being more effective. Both individually and as a cumulative group. And now I'm going to introduce you to another person who you will have probably never heard of. Admiral Henderson, of course, is the third Sea Lord in 1933 to 1939. And I've talked about him a lot on this channel. If you've never heard of Reginald Henderson before this video, cool. There are lots of mentions of him throughout my videos because I've done a lot of work on him. My PhD thesis basically covered so much of his tenure. It was a really interesting ca character. He's the first ever Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers in the Royal Navy, uh, and he serves that role from roughly 1930 to 1933, and then 1933 he's made Third Sea Lord, which means he's in charge of developing and creating the Royal Navy for World War II. And he's in charge till he dies in 1939. Now, interestingly enough, then there's a few other officers coming in in between, but in, uh, who are Third Sea Lords, and there's always a Third Sea Lord, but... In 1942, Admiral Sir Charles Edward Kennedy Purvis, a really interesting gentleman, and a really cool one, comes back to the UK after being Commander-in-Chief American West Indies Station, a post he'd been appointed to in March 1940, after having served as Commander of the 1st Cruiser Squadron in the Mediterranean. And also being president of the uh, Royal Naval College in Greenwich and vice admiral commanding the War College. So he was a senior experience officer. He comes back and his job is to assist first Dudley Pound and then Admiral Cunningham. And one of the things he does almost immediately is Pound goes... Henderson always used to run procurement. Henderson's gone. We've now had a rotating sea of junior, or junior officers coming through who are trying to oversee it, but it's such a complex business. They're overseeing it. They've got all the building work going on, 
but they aren't able to do what Henderson also did, which was, because he'd been in the post so long, he was able to run it as well as look into the future and work out what we might need. We need someone to do this. So he set up the future building committee, and he was its chair. And what is really interesting about this committee is three things. One... He doesn't give a flying hoot what the rank is of the person involved and being on it. He wants the best possible people he can put on it on it. Two. And this is always a good thing. He turns around to Stanley Goodall, who's the director of naval construction at this point, the Royal Navy's senior naval architect and therefore senior constructor in charge of all, signing off on all the Royal Navy's designs, and goes... Okay, um, I know you're really, really busy. I also know my old friend, Reggie, had a whole load of concepts done, let's call it. Can we have a look at your plans? And so they go into discussions. They have ideas for what they want in the future, but they also have the concepts is a bit of a basis. So, using these two points, they pull together and they create the Royal Navy's future fleet, which starts to be laid down by about 1943-44 onwards. Things like the Daring Class destroyers, etc., come through this committee, although the Daring Class design is one of the most interesting designs of all time, because if you just look at it and you put something called the L-70 design from about 1938 which was one of Henderson's last destroyer designs he really pushed through and the, the, the options he was considering. It's basically copy, paste and slightly modify things to take more, uh, take radar and uh, slightly different guns. When I say copy, paste, you can put the drawings over each other and go, Oh! You've changed the bar a bit. Cute! Everything else just lines up. So, considering the point of this discussion, and talking through the Malters, most of the images are supplied by various viewers of my channel who have donated them, uh, put, them uh, put them on Discord, and after I asked them if they had some pictures I could use. And this is from C. Dodders. Now, one of the first things they latch onto is the aircraft carriers. Now, one of the interesting things the Royal Navy had been working on quite early on, and there actually had been some discussions about this with the illustrious class, and with Ark Royal, was deck edge lifts. Why did the Royal Navy not go down? Because of the stabilization you need to put it in. Okay, so if you put a deck edge lift on one side of your hull, that's weights over there on that side of the hull, and it goes up and down. To balance that, you need displacement. You need weight in your hull to stop that motion from affecting the movement of your ship. Because otherwise it's a heavy object, especially when it's loaded with an aircraft. Now, when you consider ballast and all those things, that's technically included on the standard displacement. Now, the Royal Navy had actually considered the idea of possibly including deck edge lifts in the illustrious class. Those original armoured hangar carriers. Please note what I'm calling them, because they do have an armoured hangar. I'll explain that one in a second. They decided against it because it would have been too much weight, and they didn't think it would have given them enough gain. But it would have improved their air group size. That's all in the various studies and discussions, and I think I found that discussion when I was in Churchill College archives, going through some of the constructor's notes around times. I seem to remember that that came from those documents, but it could have come from the National Archives or from Greenwich. But it was a really interesting discussion to read through. They had reasonings for what they were doing. They were not blind to the disadvantages or the advantages. But centerline lifts were very useful in terms of maintaining weight and stability within the hull. Now, next thing. 
Arc Royal, of course, famously had her strength deck as her flight deck. This allowed her flight deck to be a lot stronger and made of thicker steel to enable her to land aircraft but also resi better resist damage. When you've got the armored hangar carriers, aka illustrious class, the implacables, combine them together, they have an armored flight deck. But it's over the hangar spaces mainly, and again that can be done because it's the strength deck. And by it being the strength deck, I mean that's the point at which the hull comes together. So if you consider when the hull goes up like that, you have the strength deck that holds those two sides together. That's the point of strength in the hull, and that's why you can put extra weight and armor on there. Now with the Malters, they were going to build a very, very large flight deck. They wanted a very big flight deck. That could take very heavy aircraft, so it needed to be very strong. But it was also going to be so big that it needed an expansion joint in it. It's one of the reasons why you end up with a two uh, twin island approach. Because you can't build an island across an expansion point. It doesn't work. And if you're putting an expansion joint in a hull, that's not good from an armor perspective. Believe it or not, you can't put an expansion joint in an armor. So they made the top, they decided to make the flight deck or uh, use the same trick as they used in Arc Royal, as strong a steel as they can, as thick a steel as they could, but stick the armor on the hangar deck and make that the strength deck to hold everything together. This is both a weight save measure, a stability measure, but also it's a necessary measure because of the size of the flight deck they were building and the technology they had access to at the time. I know someone is going to come to go, oh, we could build a strength deck bigger. We could build that as one deck bigger these days. You know, we could do that. You, you could, but in the time and, and the processes they're looking at and the speed they want to try and build these ships, because they want to try and get them completed in wartime to fight in the war, which they think is going to be ongoing, they have their reasons. You might not agree with all their reasons, but they have a logical chain going on there. And really, the big purpose of this was all was the aviation facilities, which are basically the Royal Navy's dream aviation facilities at this point. There is a massive hangar, which is very high. And usually at this point, people go, that is to accommodate the American aircraft, which are bigger. Also, so were some of the British aircraft coming through. But either way, the height they've chosen is actually the height they chose when they wanted to do maintenance in the main hangar as well. Well, it's because of the American aircraft. There is a factor. That is definitely a factor. I would agree. But it's also, it is the height of the maintenance. They liked for maintenance so they could get above the aircraft and get cranes in and get that from above. The thing is... That's not a debate. Both things can be true. Both are good reasons to have the higher hangar. For maintenance and to accommodate the larger American aircraft if you're using them and the future British aircraft which come through which also look bigger. That's all great. There is no reason to turn that into a debate. I'm right it's because of maintenance. I'm right because it is because of the American aircraft. You're both right. Enjoy it. Now, she was also returning to the four shaft system, which, of course, the Royal Navy does prefer the four shafts. Um, they don't like, as a rule, historically, two shafts or three shafts. They like four shafts. Why? Because of redund redundancy. Because of survivability. Their ships, any time they are producing something which is less than the four shafts and it's a major unit... You have to ask yourself, what are they trying to save? Is it money? Is it construction time? Is it weight? Yeah, the illustrious class had free shafts because of tonnage. We also have the theoretical top speed down here of 33 and a quarter knots. Now, of course, this is the Royal Navy, which brings you many ships which always seem to have an extra few knots in their, in their capacity for speed, so we will take that with a massive pinch of salt. But it's kind of like the aircraft to be carried. We're going to be between 80 and 108. Well, 
if it's the 408, that's going to include deck parking, which means it's only going to be viable in the Pacific. So, uh, potentially the Mediterranean, but, uh, but probably the Pacific. Because there is a reason you don't like deck parking in a Mediterranean. Because of aircraft getting damaged. You don't like and when you know enemy attack you, which happens quite a lot in the Mediterranean because you're never that far away from them. And you don't like it in the North Atlantic because as the Royal Navy had experience with HMS Eagle and a couple of other times as well, um, the North Atlantic has a habit of robbing you of your aircraft from your flight deck. The North Atlantic is a thief. It likes the Royal Navy's aircraft. It will take them all. And while I'm here and dealing with myths of the multi class, can I please point out that aircraft can be one or many. There is no such thing as aircrafts. Aircrafts, I can only imagine, is doing basket weaving while in the air. Aircraft, I can have ten aircraft or I can have one aircraft. There is no S on the end. Personal bugbear as a university lecturer especially when I'm teaching the history of engineering to aeronautical engineering students. I can understand making a mistake, but please, don't. So, one option for their adaptation, and this is from C. Dodders, and it's quite a cool one if you look at it. Basically, it's gone full, well, I would say full midway idea, has relocated the deck edge lifts, left the center line lifts, uh, put one deck edge on the far side. Now that's an interesting idea, but when you think about it, for long term plans, once you've got the deck edge lifts, they're the biggest. They can lift the same capacity. They can lift the same capacity, but they're 16 and a half by 11 meters. Well, the others are 13.7 by 14. I'd say, and also, you have to remember with deck edge lifts, you can always stick the tail or the nose out over the end, depending on which one's easier for you. So, it's an interesting scenario to get uh, to think about in terms of which lifts you'd actually want to replace. Especially if you're moving into the jet age. But the thing is, I would also point out with the Malters, if they had been continued in construction, but this is one of the first things, I highly doubt they would have ever been built like this. If World War II ends and they are continuing construction, they are probably ending up, end up being completed as something closer to this. Because the Royal Navy probably freezes their construction, does the various jet testings, etc. They did uh, historically in the late 1940s and then completes them in the early 1950s to a design not too dissimilar to this I can imagine I would myself reckon it would probably end up with three decades lifts uh, one starboard two port I think that's where the British would end up with. Maybe reverse that. But. So. Why would the Royal Navy building? Why didn't the Royal Navy build this kind of carrier from the beginning? Treaties. Also, once you've started existing designs, it's easier to pump out the design you've already know. You, if you keep changing designs, if you keep changing, this is one of the interesting things when you're looking at um, Axis construction during World War Two. Constantly changing, constantly trying to improve things or get a better design or something slows down production massively, introduces a huge amount of inefficiencies. Sometimes it's better to go with a not, maybe not as good a design as you can actually make, but you are actually able to make that and you can get up a rhythm and you can get a lot of them out. Because quantity does matter. 
And that's the whole case with the Light Fleet carriers. They are based on HMS Unicorn, they take design, they adapt it, and they go with it. And they literally just pump them out. And every single generation class is a minor iteration, really, on the previous class. To the point of which you could almost look at all the Light Fleet carriers that are on a produce and go, you are pretty much one class with subclasses. And that makes sense. That's faster and more efficient to build. This was going to be a new large fleet carrier. This was going to be the centerpiece of the Royal Navy's ability to deploy around the world. And again, you have to ask yourself if there isn't a certain amount of the Admiral class battlecruiser in them. I.e., the Royal Navy is building these ships, hoping they finish them in wartime, but mainly because they want to have a carrier of this size and capability already on the books when it comes to peacetime and the governments immediately go right then we're going to cut everything down to the bone to try and claw some money back and cu curb spending I honestly truly believe that the Malters, whether they've been this form or and I know Night Heron Productions was going to do another image, I'm not sure if he's actually uploaded it, but I really liked this one. I really liked the simplicity of this drawing. Or this. Doesn't matter which one it is. But what it would be is this would be the centerpiece of the Royal Navy going into the 50s, 60s, 70s probably would have actually still been in the service of the Royal Navy as they probably entered service early in the 1950s probably would be still in the service of the Royal Navy in the 1980s and the Royal Navy could well have had two, three, four of them after all that's the size, sort of carrier size carrier group you know aircraft carriers they had an operation for most of the 50s they usually had three or four strike carriers they could have been one class, one capability. They could have been HMS Africa, Gibraltar, Malta, and New Zealand. And let's be honest, any aircraft carrier named New Zealand is coming with its own plot armor. Which any ship named HMS New Zealand is already uh, comes with plot armor. But yeah. They would have been very, very useful ships. And yet they're cancelled in October 1945 and December 1945. Focus is instead left on the Audacious class. Which were not the same. And it's only two of the Audacious class that I actually pushed forward for it with. They were doing Audacious, Irresistible, Eagle, and Africa. Africa, of course, got transferred across to being a, a Malta class and then got cancelled. And Audacious became Eagle. Uh, Irresistible became Mark Royal. And Eagle, the original one of the Audacious class, was cancelled. But if we consider... Eagle and Ark Royal of the Audacious class are commissioned in October 1951 and February 1955. They're decommissioned in 1972 and 1979. One of the reasons why they're decommissioned when they are is because the Audacious class were roughly roughly 
20,000 tons less in displacement fully loaded. Best part of 20,000 tons. 20,000 tons. So the Malters do represent a far more practical option for future proofing in terms of size of initial air group but also size of hangar for growing with larger aircraft for developing themselves as time went on. If they had appeared in World War II, or if World War II had managed to drag on long enough for them to have entered service, and again, we're not talking a massive amount of time in, when we talk about this. When they're laid down, Royal Navy could probably have expected to see them in service if they kept them building at wartime pace by 1947-48. which is a tremendously long time of war, but ultimately if you'd been looking at having to do an amphibious invasion of Japan and then a slogger out in Japan, you could well be talking at getting on for that long. Because it's going to take time to move and assemble the forces for an invasion of Japan. It's going to get take time to train and prep those forces and then it's going to take time to launch, you're going to launch the invasion. All those things are going to add on and then you're going to have the fighting in Japan itself. Yes, there are estimates which have the war ending very quickly if you do all that, but I highly doubt it would go to plan, let's be honest. There was the first plan, so an idea, so when they were going to launch the invasion of Europe. And invading Europe, you have the United Kingdom of Great Britain as your large lily pad to launch from. You don't have an equivalent lily pad sitting that close to the Japanese coast. Anyway, thank you for watching. Honestly, I'd like your opinion on two questions. One, I'd like to know whether you agree with me that there is a strong suspicion that the multi-class were more about post-World War II Royal Navy centerpieces than they were necessarily about actual capability during World War II. Second question, if they had been completed, if instead of the audaciousness, if instead of doing the victorious conversion, they pushed forward with that, they pushed forward, they tested, and they'd pushed, they'd adapted the Malters. And let's be conservative. Let's say they built a bring into service three of them because they're not converting Victorious. Remember, Victorious being converted is one of the reasons why you only bring in the two, orda uh, two audaciouses. So if you're not doing Victorious, and you're not doing the two audacious, that's three ships, so let's say they bring in three. Okay, there is a logic. What do you think happens when you've got three such ships? Brand new, far bigger, far more easily able to accommodate large numbers of aircraft, Does the same decision happen later on in the 1970s or well, 1960s and 1970s or are perhaps their utility, especially not just in terms of the UK but in terms of NATO, makes them more appreciated and more useful? Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you found it interesting. And I continue to try and make these videos roughly 20 minutes, but they keep ending roughly up roughly 40 minutes. Take care.